Hello, everybody. I want to welcome all of you to this webinar on banded sleeve gastrectomy. Today, to this very interesting topic, we have a very prominent speaker. It's Jodok Fink from Freiburg. He uh, is the main focus in his study is for several years now on banded sleeve gastrectomy. He published two very interesting paper, one pair matched analysis dealing with five years data and more recently an RCT published in an annals of surgery with three years results of a prospective randomized study on banded sleeve gastrectomy. Before I hand over to Professor Fink, uh, we have two poll questions, and uh, I want you to answer uh, these two poll questions. So please, the first one. Banding the sleeve cross gastrectomy aggravates reflux. Yes or no? Please vote now. You will have approximately 20 seconds for voting. So bending the sleeve makes reflux worse, yes or no? Thank you. Then we go, so you see, ah, wow, that's quite interesting. 84% say no, it does not aggravate reflux, and only 16% say yes it aggravates reflux. So we will see after Professor Fink's talk and some discussion whether uh, the audience believes in other things or not. And the second poll question we have is, is anyone concerned that bending the sleeve leads to serious complications like uh, erosion of the band and other uh, severe side effects and complications. So yes or no, please vote now. You have 20 seconds again. Banding the sleeve leads to serious complications. Thank you for voting. The results are, well, there is more concern on that. Uh, more than 40% believe, yes, that bending the sleeve can lead to serious complications. And 57% say, no, does not lead to serious complications. So um, this will be two uh, topics I hope we will hear in the talk of Professor Fink. Professor Fink published more than 73 uh, papers in and he's uh, very experienced also runs some lab stuff on metabolic surgery and Yodok, the stage is yours please tell us something about your studies well Gerd, thank you very much for the kind introduction can everybody see my presentation now yes okay you can see perfect so i will i mean, hope to show you all the evidence there is on banded sleep gastrectomy and um, as I'm the only speaker today with a bit more time, and so I also try to, you know, at least, you know, let you participate in at least our learning curve here in Freiburg. And I hope to bit change your mind on, on, on uh, dangers of banded sleep gastrectomy, although there are definitely somatic complications, but I hope to show that it's not too much to and actually overcome the benefits of it. So these are my conflicts of interest and let me start with that you know slide probably many of you uh, know but I just want to show and make clear that sleep gastrectomy itself is a very frequently performed operation. We just recently had our German society meeting a couple of days ago where we you know all certified centers talked and definitely within all our certified centers, sleeve gastrectomy in Germany is the mostly performed bariatric operation. And if you look at the worldwide numbers, um, it's very much alike. So we do talk about obviously a very relevant, if not the most relevant uh, type of bariatric surgery. And I mean, if you want to do a proper banded sleeve, 
you definitely need a good sleeve because without a good sleeve, it's not going to be any type of good banded sleeve. And um, obviously, there are some factors that influence a sleeve hysterectomy. One is bougie size, and this you know consensus conference in in 2000. 11 agreed that the bougie should be small. I personally don't know, it has to be below 40. Um, but nevertheless, it should be small and not too large. If you start stapling, um, the transection should begin somewhere between two to six centimeters from the pylorus. So obviously, if you start six centimeters from the pylorus, you leave the antrum, whereas if you start two, you resect it. And at least when I look at all these data on antral resection, I don't think that this topic, 2020, um, is very clear of what, what's best um, to do. Definitely the last firing of the stapler should be a bit away um, from the esophagus in order to actually avoid all these complications we fear up there. And obviously you have to you know, very properly mobilize your stomach in order to, um, well, you know, create a good sleeve in order to prevent any twists. And definitely we want to do a banded sleeve hysterectomy. Um, you need to have full visualization of um, the pancreas as well. Now, why do we even talk about banded sleeve hysterectomy? And the main reason for me is weight regain after sleeve hysterectomy. And these are results from a, from a Hong Kong center I just like that um, graph, but the results are quite similar throughout um, many studies. And what you see, this is only five years after surgery. For one, you have only about half of patients that you know present with excess weight was above 50%, and our data are quite similar on that. And on the other hand, you have about 30% of patients that have a clinically relevant weight regain up here defined as 25% um, percent access weight loss. Um, so weight regain is a problem. And if you look at this meta-analysis, it basically shows the same thing in, in more European, and Garrett, this is your group, a more European um, a type of setting, that weight regain is a relevant problem. Here you have uh, weight loss failure rates of about 30 percent of patients. And if you now then look at the, the, the percentage of patients that got revised, the reason for revision for insufficient weight loss or weight regain was higher than revisions due to reflux, at least in this meta-analysis. And probably all of you that listened to this talk would agree that reflux is a relevant problem after sleep hysterectomy. If you, you, know, you know, take this as a benchmark, um, um, definitely weight regain is another relevant problem as well. And the other thing that prompted us to actually ban sleeves are good results after banning gastric bypass. And if you just keep this graph in mind and you'll find that in a, in a banded gastric bypass, the gap between the greens and the blues, the bandits and non bandits opens somewhere around um, three to four years after surgery. And typically, even in a, in a bypass, patients regain a bit of body weight in a non-banded group, whereas they keep their weight loss in the bandits. And if you keep that graph in mind, you kind of see a very, or will see a very similar uh, uh, thing after the bandit sleep distracting. And the only thing to us that you know keeps us surgeons, us bariatric surgeons, away from banning our procedures is this picture. All the bad results we know, or all the bad experience we have uh, uh, from from gastric bands. And, and I'm still quite young, so I come from an area where I only see these bad results and never saw the early success of, of, of gastric bands. But definitely migration, erosion, even of the tube here. That's what keeps you know, us surgeons away from banning our procedures. But I don't think that a banning procedure is the same as a lap ban. In a lap ban, you know, here shown on the left-hand side of the picture, you obviously need to create constant pressure on the gastric wall by inflating 
the inner part of the, the gastric band in order to create that pouch above the, the band. Whereas in the band of procedure, and the, the later videos will hopefully show that quite nicely, you, that in the band of procedures, we place the ring loosely around that pouch. So there's no constant pressure, the implant is small, and that's probably the reason why we don't see the same complications. And if you could argue that bandless hysterectomy is still quite new, definitely banner gastric bypass is not. And looking at all the data of banner gastric bypass, you only find a very small number of erosion and migration after that type of surgery. And probably the main reason is that it avoids constant pressure on, on the pouch or gastric wall to that matter. Now, we primarily started somewhere around 2009, 2010, uh, with banding our sleeves and published the first silicone banded um, gastric sleeve in 2011. At that time, we used GABP rings um, and closed the ring down. I don't know if it says it here. We closed it um, at a circumference of six and six and a half centimeters and placed it around six centimeters below um, the gastroesophageal junction. And results from these, you know, first, you know, sleeves, banded sleeves in, in 25 patients, we did that, you know, small match pair analysis, 50 patients at 25, 25 in each group, basically showed that early after surgery, there was no extra benefit. But that's something um, we very much expected looking at the results after banded gastric bypass. And if you, as you know, listeners, still remember that early picture, um, it's just the same as after banded gastric bypass. But the reason why we looked at our early patient collective was more we wanted to find out if there were any you know, added complication. And definitely perioperatively, there was no you know, added you know, danger that we had no extra, you know, intraoperative and early possible complications in this uh, group. And I mean, you had that poll question on reflux. And we were in the beginning very concerned that maybe placing an extra, you know, silicone ring up there may even aggravate reflux. But even these early results showed that it did not. So reflux is basically very similar in balance and non balance states. But what we did see that vomiting was increased, you know, uh, tremendously, and about 40% of our patients needed to, to vomit at least once a week. And in our later publications, we changed just semantically, we changed vomiting to regurgitation. Um, and not in it to, to, you know, to make it sound less severe, but actually what patients, you know, report to us is that they regurgitate just the last thing they've eaten and has nothing to do with classic, you know, high volume vomiting, like if you have an Eilers patient or anything like this. But definitely this was the major side effect of the ring initially. And then we went back with a bit larger patient cohort three years after surgery and again looked at weight loss and complications of our group and, and you know basically could find what we had hoped for and we you know initially uh, projected that as time passes there will be a significant you know benefit in weight loss and it's, it is you know it turned out exactly as after panic gastric bypass the regular group non-banded group starts to regain weight whereas the banded group's weight loss almost stays on one line. And the difference in excess weight loss in this study was um, just around uh, 10%, which I think also is clinically relevant. Now, let's look at the complications. Again, reflux was not different. You see there's, you know, statistically, but also if you look at the, the numbers of reflux improvement. And this is what we you know, quite consistently see that if all the patients we ask, and this is just reflux symptoms, I know I mean, it's not the full truth, but nevertheless, reflux symptoms improve in the majority of patients. And on the other hand, of, on the other hand there is a fair number of patients that develop 
you know, de novo reflux symptoms. And again, the major negative effect of the ring was regurgitation. And this patient collective and regurgitation stayed around 40%. And obviously, this you know, huge gap, 40 to 40%, um, is statistically significant. So three years after surgery, better weight loss, again, the only side effect, regurgitation. Coming back with a now patient collective around 100 patients of 51 bandits, 51 non-bandits, um, analyzing them five years after surgery. And in that study, the median uh, follow-up was five years. You, you see a continuous development of weight regain in the non-bandits, whereas a continued good weight loss in the bandit group. And again, we looked at reflux and regurgitation, and no surprise, it stayed very much alike. Reflux continued not to be a negative effect of, of a appendicitis of the additional ring, but regurgitation stayed up there. But to us, we were concerned that you know as time passes, regurgitation may even increase. But at least in this study, we could not show that this was the case. It stayed high but it definitely did not go up any higher. And this is just to point it out as a, a I, I would call it a negative example. This is one of the first bandit sleeve you revised a bit later. Just look where the ring is. I mean, you can see the sleeve now. I just, you know, I, I myself, you know, remember me pausing, wow, where was that ring? And you see it down here. So I, Personally, don't think that we put it in that low. So it definitely did slip a bit, but in the very beginning, we put them somewhere around here, somewhere around that area, just up here. That's where we initially probably uh, placed that sleeve. But this is a very typical development that you know patients that have banner procedures want to keep these banner procedures. So this patient specifically asked to a keep the sleeve and b keep the ring. So what we did, we did. You did a re-band sleep gastrectomy and just showing you um, um, the, the, the end result now. And just look as an example, you know, see the difference between the initial picture and what we think is appropriate now. We place it very high around, you know, two to four centimeters below the GE junction. That's what we now think the, um, the ring should ideally be placed. Now, I just before I continue with the talk, I want to define what I think is standard today. So we use a small a bougie, any we use a 35 to be precise, and I think you just you know copied that from from the standard sleeve up there. So personally, I think anywhere between 35 you know, and 40 is fine. And in 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 relation to what we did in our earlier studies, we increased ring size. You know, probably know most of the, the people that at least publish on fantasy distracted me, and all of them um, consistently tell me that they keep increasing ring sizes. And at least if you use the minimizer, it gives you a threshold somewhere between 6.5 and 8 centimeters circumference. Um, so you, you can play around with this a bit, but we currently close all our rings at 7.5 centimeters. As I pointed out, the ring position should not be too too low. It should be somewhere between you know two to four centimeters below the GE junction. And my personal opinion is that the implant should be pre-specified. I mean, especially the US surgeons have a problem because they don't have a certified implant at present. So they do have to you know make their implant themselves. But at least in Europe and the rest of the world, we can use pre-specified implants and definitely think that results will be a bit more reproducible if you do that. Now, this is an example of how we, you know, how we do it today. Obviously, you need to create a proper sleeve. And well, as always with these, you know, example videos, this was not the toughest case I've ever done um, in a BMI around uh, 40 uh, something. But it, you know, nicely you can more nicely definitely show what's actually going on, and the, you need to preserve left gastric vessel, and that's the only thing we are 
I don't want to say afraid, but we pay very much attention to. And the other thing we pay attention to that we at least try not to affect the vagal branches that just go, you know, alongside the lesser curvature. And that's the reason why we use the perigastric uh, instead of the pars flaccida technique, which I know a couple surgeons that perform bandit sleeves um, use. And then you can see even here that the, the, the ring is placed loosely around that pouch, especially, I mean, you see that when once the, the bougie has been removed and then obviously we, we fix that ring. And just as a little trick that what we have learned, I wanna show you this again, we grasp that minimizer ring where we, just one position below where we think um, the ring should be closed at, and that way, if you know, you don't have the situation that it's too tight. You can open it, but sometimes it could be hard, and at least I have broken one or two implants in doing that, and definitely you could save that money, but just grasping um, that piece of the ring. So, this is a band of sleeve, um, how we do it today. Now, what's the evidence from all the other groups and i've just tried to show you or will try to show you you know the entity of you know all, all the evidence because there's not that much more besides what we published um, ourselves there are two two more studies that retrospectively analyze um and these studies one is from Le Glemens from belgium and the other one is from open Bari from an indian um patient collector and there's one besides our randomized controlled trial, which you know, which data you have not seen yet. There is another Italian trial that was designed very similar, but with a bit smaller patient collector. Now, the Belgian data are very similar to ours. You see that the gap openings opens two to three years after surgery. Here you see a weight regain. This is you know, BMI plotted, you see weight regain in the non-banded sleeves, whereas in the bandits, weight loss, that study even continues to increase a little bit. And if you look, you know, at the major weight, you know, the major benefits, this study nicely, you know, works out that weight regain is the major, major advantage after banded sleeve construction. We look at the numbers two versus 20% of weight regain, that's where you get the benefit. And the Indian study is quite uh, similar. This is a larger patient collective. There's also very good follow-up, a median follow-up of five years after surgery. And just look, I just want to point out the percent excess weight loss. And here you see the same thing, regain in non-bandits, continue weight loss in the bandits. And that Indian study even was able to show that Due to the ring, I mean, you see this gap here, there is a bit of, you know, extra weight loss primarily. Now, I will come back to, to complications of all these trials later on and I'll try to work them up, you know, in, in the cumulative um, slide. Now, probably the, the highest level of evidence comes from, from our randomized control trial published this year. And our patient collective was um, calculated to be 94 patients. So we then obviously randomized them one to one, banded to non banded sleep hysterectomy, followed them up quite tightly, and then ended up with a quite good follow up of almost all. We missed two patients in the bandits and one patient in the non banded So follow up was way beyond 90%, which is quite good for any randomized trial. Sorry. And in that trial, ring, the ring size we used was instead of you know the early earlier trials, 7.5 centimeter circumference. Now, the patient collected from that trial is very typical to what you see in, in, in any German sleeve patient collective. So what are here? The median or mean BMI was above 50, it was a predominantly, you know, 74% female um, with a fair number of people, patients with hypertension, 
and type 2 diabetes. And although, I mean, this is not a magic pair, but the randomized controlled trial, the numbers were not statistically different in, in any, and also that our control groups, so they're not statistically different in any of these items. This is the major outcome of that study. Difference in access weight loss three years after surgery was 11.6%. And if you remember what I said earlier in a you know, retrospective study with a very similar number of patients, we had a difference in access weight loss of 10%. So if you do the same thing in a prospective setting, we could you know, verify this benefit in weight loss. And the development of the curves are almost alike. You see a bit of weight regain in the non-bandits um, and continued good weight loss results in the bandit. So and definitely we re-examined this group five years after surgery, which we did not, you know, did not primarily plan as because the primary input was, you know, weight loss three years after surgery. I bet you see an even greater gap in excess weight loss. Now, again, looking at you know complications and resolution of comorbidities, we could show that by tendency, and but that was definitely not statistically significant, by tendency, that better you know, weight loss was you know, a bit visible and a better resolution of comorbidities. Study was never powered to show that, um, but we had resolution of type 2 diabetes was 90 versus 66%. Um, res resolution or you know, medication use stopped in hypertension, 60 to 40 percent. So there was a tendency to actually, you know, a benefit also for obesity-related comorbidities, which you always see in these trials when you show extra weight loss. Now coming to complications, the, the complications also in this prospective setting were not different between Bennett and non bandit sleep hysterectomy. Obviously, if you do something extra, you may have extra complications. And the extra complication we saw in this trial was um, ring slippage in one patient. Definitely, that was not you know, any or to, towards significance, but this is obviously something extra we had from implanting the ring, but only one out of 45. And in the end, all of that also resulted in a better quality of life that was significantly better three years after surgery. We used the, the BEARA score to measure this. Now, in the next slides, I try actually to, to sum up all um, the, compli oh, sorry, the complications. Before that, um, I want to show you the, the, the study of um, uh, Paula Gentileschi, which is the other randomized controlled trial um, from, from Italy. And his patient collective was you know, a bit similar, but definitely his patients were around four to five BMI points lighter than, than ours. The rest was quite um, um, similar. And if you look at his results, you see, basically you see the same thing. You see better weight loss, three and four years after surgery. And he didn't write too much on complications that will I now um, show you. So if you look at all these studies, Belgian trial from Luke Lemons, Indian trial from Opandari, this is you know, data from the randomized controlled trial, Paolo Gentileschi, and the German trials were ours. And I try to put up our retrospective results up here whereas the prospective results are down there, just to guide you through this slide. Regarding reflux, most of the other groups just do not report any rough problem, and many of the others do not analyze reflux. So we did, and as I've shown you, there was no difference in our retrospective trials. If you look at our prospective trial, you see that reflux was reflux symptoms, to be precise, were significantly less in the bandit group. I don't understand you saying that placing a ring will, you know, will, will have you know a major benefit in reflux symptoms. But all along, and, and also working through all you know the discussions with the reviewers of all these papers, everybody was concerned that it might aggravate reflux. 
But to this date, we have no data whatsoever that support an aggravation of reflux um, placing a silicone ring, at least, in a sleeve. And I mean, we all know that reflux symptoms have a huge uncertainty in, in, in diagnostic as, you know, it's all about reflux esophagitis and, and, and Barrett's that will in the end cause the major problem. So we did our best in that randomized control trial to rescope all our patients three years after surgery. And what we saw was quite interesting and a bit similar to what we, you know, I showed you earlier that there is a proportion of patients where reflux gets better. And there's another proportion of patients that had no reflux preoperatively that does develop reflux. And it's the same if you scope the patient. We had 23 in the bandits with 23% of low-grade reflux esophagitis preoperatively. Obviously, higher-grade reflux esophagitis, we would have not done a sleeve. And the majority of this, these patients went into remission or improved in both groups. And then there was another proportion of patients that developed de novo esophagitis postoperatively. And again, the ring did not have any negative impact. If at all, it was protective of de novo reflux esophagitis, but definitely not statistically significant. Now, regurgitation, with, which to us, and I've shown you that, is the major side effect of the ring. Um, the Belgian study reports regurgitation of around 7% in their bandits, but also in their regular studies. The Indian study says there was only one out of about 100 patients with bandits leave gastrectomy presenting with regurgitation. The quote is, he had trouble eating chapati. So obviously it was not a big you know, deal in the Indian patient collective. The Italian study didn't, you know, they couldn't find it, uh, analyze regurgitation. I've shown you our retrospective numbers. And if you look at the prospective study, you still see a significance there. But I just want to point out frequent regurgitation. And the reds with the bandits, frequent regurgitation went down to 13%. And I mean, we obviously thought, where's the difference? And the only difference there is is ring, I mean, these are the only two parameters you can control for ring diameter or ring circumference and ring position. And if you look at this, we increased ring, position, ring diameter from 6.5 to 7.5. And if you look at all the others that do not report a major problem with the regurgitation, they use larger rings. And a bit unscientifically, I tried to mingle all our prospective and retrospective data just for this talk in, in, in one slide. And I mean, it speaks for itself. You see that the, the benefit in weight loss does not change if you increase ring size by one centimeter. So we go from 6.5 to 7.5 centimeters, benefit will definitely be the same. But if you look at side effects, and this is remarkable, you decrease uh, you know, frequent regurgitation from around 40% to around 10%, with it definitely you know, a lot better to control and, and, and to talk to patients to. Now, coming to conclusion, I think today, 2020, we have high level of evidence that shows better weight loss when banding a sleeve. We have two randomized control trials and a couple of retrospective trials that consistently show the same thing. If you compare that to banding gastric bypass, it again is the same. So this probably is quite, quite real and true. There's a small percentage of side effects. That's a personal point of view to us. It's mostly regurgitation. The only Achilles heel there is that we don't have today any true long-term data. But you know, taking everything to account, and especially if there's a very low number of band sleeves, I think the band sleeve hysterectomy is an underestimated and underused um, procedure today. So I want to thank you for your attention and, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions.
Thank you very much, Yulok, for the very stimulating lecture. Uh, dear audience, please post more questions in the chat. You have the opportunity uh, all the time. And right now, one of the questions was, Yulok, uh, could you explain uh, the theoretical background, how bending the sleeve could improve the reflux symptoms? We don't know really about we, I mean, obviously the ring will, I mean, the, the, the acid producing cells is somewhere lower down in the antrum and, and the fundus. There also is some up there, but maybe the ring acts as, you know, a reflux barrier. This is what even Mason, the VBG, although you know, saying the VBG was good, but when he thought about, you know, creating that VBG, he also thought that this was an anti-reflux operation. We know today because of the small outlet size, it's not. But uh, initially, this was his idea that it would prevent the reflux of the reflux of acid, you know, above that ring. That may be true. How many rings of of your series did you have to remove due to regurgitation? I mean, in, even in your study, you have a regurgitation rate of thirteen uh, percent. So. Uh, being a patient, I would consider if I regurgitate, let's say, four times a week of getting the ring removed. So how many did you have to remove? In our retrospective studies, we removed four or five. And that, you know, within three years' time, we didn't remove one. And, and I know that instead of removing it, Luke in Belgium, he tries to enlarge the ring a bit. And that, at least in his opinion and his results, helps uh, the patients. And the interesting thing is that they want to keep, they all want to keep their ring. There's some that they're fed up and say they have to, you know, regurgitate again and again. But most of these patients want to keep their ring. Um, and what we primarily do, they come with regurgitation, we do a barium swallow and show if there's any trouble with the ring. I remember the one ring we did remove in, in our randomized control trial was actually patient number one, as I remember her quite well. And she came with a slippage. She had no problem, but all of a sudden she needed to regurgitate again and again. And this was due to a slippage. You showed the video of uh, some time after the banded sleeve, and you said you did not put the band that deep. And what you could see on the video was kind of a sack of the sleeve on top of the ring. Now I'm a little bit devil's advocate. So the ring is not restrictive from the beginning, but becomes restrictive with time, which means you create another high pressure zone with time, which will lead to a dilatation of the stomach on top of it. Would you agree on that? <laughs> At this, least in your video, it looked like that. It definitely was like this. I mean, I did re-sleeve the whole thing because it was dilated. But exactly. this, if you place the ring if you place the ring too low, this is exactly what happens. It's the same in a banded bypass. If you do a long pouch and just place it a little bit above the anastomosis, it, you, you could, and if you, especially if you, you know, pull it through tightly, you create an hourglass. And this is what will happen. But with large ring sizes, and, and obviously you need a bit of compliance uh, on the patient side, that works. And we don't consistently see this. Uh, I would be interested in the long-term run. You know, there is now the migration crisis. Everybody talks about the staple line going to the posterior mediastinum, contributing to reflux symptoms. You have now in your RCT three years uh, results, but you oversee, of course, patients now with nine years. Do you see more or the same number or less of migration of the staple line of the sleeve to the posterior mediastinum? What, what do you say? That migration, we, I don't remember, one of my first publications was MRI study of sleeves uh, together with one of the, the, the radiologists from our department. And what we found years ago was migration of the staple line to the mediastinum. And, Honestly, doing all these barium swallows, we have it in tons of patients. And yeah, but in the barium swallows, you don't see the staple line precisely because they're too small. You see it on the 3D CT scan or on the, the MRI. But you, well, you can on the barium swallows, I fully agree, you can only guess that they're out there. 
But um, you see, well, what you see is a hernia. That yes. you see, and if you've done it correctly, the staple line must be up there. That's a hernia. Otherwise, you know, you left the hernia and staple somewhere below. But I, I fully agree. Migration of the staple line up there is a, a problem. But I think it will, you know, happen in a lot of cities. And we have not seen a particularly, you know, aggravated situation in the bandits. We do have that in the bandits as well, and they do come with reflux. Um, and we have revised, of, you know, in 10 years' time, we have revised a couple of them um, to a RUIGV. But um, I personally do not think this was due to the rain, but this was just due to the sleep. Another question from the audience is, I'm a bit confused. Some put bands, others make a Nissan, like David Knocker. Uh, what's your opinion? See, <laughs> I've also seen these Nissan sleeves. I mean, there are all types of surgery out there now, and 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 if you if you, it's a hard question to answer. I don't think that, and I don't want to stand here saying, don't misinterpret me. I don't want to stand here saying that bandit sleeves an anti-reflux operation. I think yeah. it's a different focus. David Knocker focus on reflux after sleeve to treat or prevent this complication. Yeah. You aim at prevention of weight regain, which is and a whole different story. And I was afraid of my aggravate reflux. And the only thing I want to say is to all the data say it does not aggravate, just as the poll question initially said. You're fully right. The focus is different. We want to we aim for extra weight loss and not for anti-reflux. Yeah. Um, other questions were, uh, Luke Lemons used 6.5 to 7.5 centimeters, so rather tighter rings, and had the same percentage of regurgitation in both groups. How can you explain Luke's data, especially in the light that you have a three-fold difference in regurgitation? I've talked to him about this as well. I mean, I know him well, and he says now he uses 7.5. So he started off using six and a half, coming from our study and from his bandits, bandit bypasses. Then he went up to seven in, in, in males, no, seven in females and seven and a half in males. And now he uses seven and a half for everybody. So obviously maybe, he doesn't have a problem with regurgitation. Maybe I did, not, I did not take the question right once more. You use only 7.5, and three, and you see a three-fold difference between banded and non-banded sleeve with the big ring in terms of regurgitation, correct? Oh, and look, you 6.5 to 7.5 centimeter, which means definitely smaller rings. So the difference between the banded and non-banded, you would assume, is even higher than threefold. And he has no difference. I, I, I agree, but he, he, I mean, in his series, if you remember, it was 7% for both groups. And yeah. it, it just, it's a matter of how you interpret regurgitation. We always, you know, talked about frequent regurgitation. And definitely, now I lost you, the frequent regurgitation did not, you know, happen to 7% in the non bandits So just the numbers of non bands are a lot lower. Okay, so the, the question of definition again. Another question from the audience is slippage. Uh, would you always indicate non-compliant patients? Do you consult patients to ensure that they are eating in the proper way? We know most patients lie, lie with what they put in their mouth. <clears throat> the only option we have is to ask our patients. And I think, to be honest, they at least from my point of view, they usually tell you the truth because they will need something from you. And and I'm quite convinced that they more or less, you know, say the right thing. And what we see that eating habits in bandits are a bit different to non-bandits. Non-bandits, they eat meat and, and, and the first point of view, the, the, the food they take in is a bit more healthy. Whereas the bandit patients love carbs because, I mean, they dissolve in the mouth and, you know, Pass that ring more easily. I just, you know, had had the webinar with Malphobia, and he says, being a bandit patient himself, he said if he eats a steak, he does that privately. 
Yeah. So you would consider that there is a, a difference in eating pattern and habits between banded and non-banded. Definitely there is. Yeah. And do you select uh, compliant patients or no? Would you would you give a banded procedure to a patient uh, you have the feeling that is incompliant or no? You don't select. Okay. I mean, in that study, in, in the randomized control trial, we tried to truly uh, randomize these patients. But others than that, um, no. Yeah. So can we have our two poll questions once more, please? Maybe just in between. So the first question was, bending the sleeve gastrectomy aggravates reflux, makes it worse. Yes or no, please vote now. What is your opinion whether bending the sleeve makes reflux worse, yes or no. We again have around 20 seconds to vote. And I think voting is closed now. Can we see the result? Exactly. So I think it's pretty similar to what we had before. The majority of people believes that it does not make it worse and only 17% believe that it aggravates reflux bending the sleep. So I think you did a good job on that, a very good job. And the second question was about the complications. Uh, we did not cover that in detail. Is anyone concerned that bending the sleeve leads to serious complications? Yes or no? Please vote now. And again, I think 20 seconds are over. Can we see the results now? This was not so clear before. We had around 45% who claimed yes. And now this changed dramatically. So 84% now believe that bending the sleeve does not lead to serious complications. So fantastic for you, Yolok. This is a very clear message you brought. Uh, I have one more question for you. Uh, coming from banding and angel chick prothesis against reflux decades ago, uh, you will not remember, but all the surgeons do remember, these, these implants were found in the urinary bladder, in the uh, colon and everywhere in the body. Um, do you see, or what is your erosion rate of banded sleeve? What's no. your experience? None yet. We have no erosions in our banded sleeves. We have, I think I remember two patients with erosions in a banded gastric bypass. But yeah. my personal opinion is that in both of these patients, we just implanted the ring too close to the anastomosis, so they kind of work their way through uh, in the area of the anastomosis, but if you don't do that, if you don't primarily injure the stomach wall, you hardly see any of this. Is at least what the literature, you know, consistently shows. Okay. There are some more questions. Uh, Peter Vashas wants to know when would you offer banding for fade sleeve and not ruin wide gastric bypass as a secondary procedure. So, do you offer banding the sleeve as a secondary procedure? And if yes, in which situation? I've just shown you that video, the rebanded sleeve, but to be honest, that's the only we have done. <laughs> so, uh, there is no data on it. We could just guess. And, and if you have failed weight loss or weight regain, and you have to, to it's not so easy to have a proper recommendation um, uh, for the patients. Data on re-sleeve are still quite new and not, you know, extremely good. But now if you add a band on this, I mean, it might work, it may not. I cannot tell you to date. Let's make the question different. You have a patient with failed sleeve. What do you offer this patient? <laughs> it depends. If you reflux, what we like to do or if we have you know, any reason to convert it to a bypass, I'd rather go for a bended bypass than to do a re-bended sleeve gastrectomy. Okay, 
And for weight three gain, the same true, banded rule and y? You can do that. Yeah, banded rule y with a long biliopancreatic loop. If you want to avoid any uh, type of, you know, severely malabsorptive surgery. Okay. A place for Saudi? You've done that. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Another question from Dario Pettini. Regurgitation was based on symptoms or on functional studies? Symptoms. It was based on symptoms and not on measured data. This is, of course, something... Well, how, how could you wonder regurgitation? I mean, so we just asked the patient semi-quantitatively if how often they had to regurgitate. Uh, sorry, I mixed up now regurgitation and reflux symptoms. For regurgitation, throwing up, you don't need functional studies. But for reflux, you would need functional studies. Is this correct? Get, uh, fully correct for a proper, I mean, obviously, and, and you know from your group, there are a lot of publications out there showing that 24-hour pH manometry, um, well, shows different things than just asking the patients. Um, but well, we just simply did not, you know, have the focus on this in, in, in our study. But we, at least what we tried, you know, as you know, a, a bypass, we at least try to scope our patients, um, yeah, making sure very that hard. Are I agree, and it's very hard to to bring the patient to a pH metry before and the second one after one or three years, because who likes to have 24 hours? Uh, a probe in his or her nose. So this is always a challenge, at least with our patients. Well, I think there are no more questions to answer. So I think you did a very good job also of, uh, dealing with the poll questions. I think you convinced many people. Um, yeah, all. if there are any further questions, please post them and I think Professor Fink will answer them afterwards yeah. so i want to thank bariatric solutions for enabling this webinar on a, maybe a little bit more controversial topic and i want to thank professor fink for his excellent lecture and showing us the evidence on bandit sleeve gastrectomy and for all our audience stay safe and hope to come through this very challenging time of covid 19 uh, in the next few months Thank you very much, all of you. Bye-bye.